Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Uh, Brian Bokweiss here, uh, creator of The Toys That Made Us, and uh, you're listening to my boy Galaxy on Comic-Con Radio, and I hope you noticed when I said good morning. Uh, that's like how Bill Paxton said it at uh, the beginning of his speech at Independence Day, but uh, good morning. <laughs> Every now and then in my office, I still find myself doing that. <laughs> it opens a door to a whole other world. Lego is a part of everybody's life. Robots in disguise, more than meets the eye. To me, it's genius. Not exactly a warp speed, but it'll do for a kid in the 70s. I'm a crazy Hello Kitty lady. They have lunch boxes, stickers, thermometers, paper shredders, a shoulder massager. Or as reporters would refer to it, a Hello Kitty vibrator. Business was really tough. When Star Trek first went on the air, it was not a toy phenomenon right away. They just put Star Trek stickers on and then repackage it. They were toys I wouldn't buy. Oh my God. It just wasn't good product. Lego had the first loss in company history in 98. $220 million. Lego almost went bankrupt. The licensing situation was a real mess. We bought Star Trek for an advance and guarantee of $5,000. We did over $50 million in Star Trek business. We went from these rough toys to almost model quality. We all knew it was going to be big, but then it surprised us. It was bigger than we thought. Hello Kitty has been always number one. In 2014, Lego became the largest toy company worldwide. Timing is everything. <laughs> Welcome to the toy industry. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is Galaxy signing in for Comic-Con Radio. Coverage of pop culture events from around the globe. Amazing interviews with celebrities. Daily recaps and reviews of popular television. Movie reviews. Everything Comic-Con and fandom from around the globe. Comic-Con Radio. Get ready to enter our universe. Let's go. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is your boy Galaxy for another amazing episode of Comic-Con Radio. Today we have a really cool dude. He makes these cool shows on Netflix, and it's all about toys and movies and all sorts of fun stuff. Today, we have Brian Volk Weiss from the Toys That Made Us on Comic-Con Radio. Hello. Brian, what's up, buddy? How are you? I am good. Thank you for uh, having me on. I am happy that you're on. Very excited. I love your show. You know, I have a lot of guests that come on the show. I watch some shows. I don't watch some, but I personally love your show. It's really <laughs> fun and amazing. Congrats on that. You're very kind. Uh, thank you for saying that. It, uh, it, I've produced a lot of stuff that uh, no one cares about, to put it diplomatically. Uh, so, uh, I am always extremely appreciative, uh, when I hear what you just said. So thank you very much. It's, uh, it's very kind. Well, you've been doing this for a long time. You work with Kevin Hart and you work with Jim Gaffigan. You produce a show for Craig Ferguson, another show called Stevie TV. You've done a lot in the comedy world. I, d d yes, I am definitely embedded in comedy. That is, uh, that is as, as factually uh, accurate a statement uh, as, as there is. The sky is blue and, and I am embedded in comedy. <laughs> well, I said that because a lot of your shows are related to amazing celebrities and comedy specials. I actually watched your Kevin Hart series, The Guide to Black History. I thought it was really cool. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing I would just mention, because you said you're a fan of it, part of the reason I think that people like Toys That Made Us is, you know, there's a lot of comedy in it. And, you know, I think a lot of people, if they had made the same show, it wouldn't have been as funny. And, you know, when we got greenlit, the people I hired uh, were people I'd already worked with and loved, and most of them had a comedy background. So I, I think that's a reason why people like the show so much. That's a, obviously, it's just a guess. But um, I think that's a big part of it. The show brings up a lot of nostalgic moments, history, people's childhood. And many of the people that grew up in those eras really connect to what you're doing. And toys are the coolest thing on earth. Who doesn't love them? I am biased, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, but uh, yes, 
Uh, I love them, just speaking for myself. So what made you want to do that show? Because there's some stuff out there, some YouTube channels that try to like look like your show, but they're not your show. And then you came up with this show, went on Netflix, and now it's like super duper cool and fun and everybody loves it. So funny, so often in life you things happen and you don't know how it started. This is one where I know exactly where it started. Uh, it took me a long time to sell the show. Uh, so I was trying to, the, my epiphany moment uh, was uh, about eight years before uh, it sold. Uh, and I was in a Borders Books that is now a supermarket. And uh, I was uh, basically like, for some reason, I was like, well, like, what's the origin of uh, Transformers? Where does Transformers come from? Like, who, how did Optimus Prime get his name? And I went around the bookstore. I talked to the people that worked there, and there were no books about the origin of Transformers. Uh, that got me thinking, and then I walked around some more. I realized there was no book about the origin of He-Man or Barbie or G.I. Joe or whatever. The only stuff about the toys, uh, there was one or two books about Star Wars toys, but they were just kind of like listing stuff that had been made. Uh, there really wasn't too much about how or why they got made. And then I just remember on that same visit, I, there was like 12 books about the War of 1812. And, uh, and again, I mean, no, no disrespect to the War of 1812 or anything, but it's like, why are there 12 books on the War of 1812, but no books on Transformers origins? And again, no disrespect to the wonderful War of 1812, but uh, so many people are alive are familiar with Transformers. Like my wife, she never played with Transformers. She doesn't know anything about Transformers, but on site, she could say, oh, that's Optimus Prime. Oh, that's Bumblebee. So why was there nothing about it? And that was the quote unquote eureka moment. Where I was like, huh. Somebody should do something about this. And that's literally the beginning of the toys that made us. That was a way that I would have thought you created the show. You're looking for a book. You couldn't find one. And you're like, hey, I do cool shows. Let me create a show all about toys. But the way you did it was really exciting. And you started off with a really cool toy franchise, which everybody loves. And you came out during Christmas time in 2017, and you started with Star Wars. What made you choose Star Wars first? Well, a couple things. Number one, uh, I mean, I would be a dentist or a lawyer in New York right now if it wasn't for Star Wars. I mean, I, I am in show business because of Star Wars. Um, and it, it, you know, it's just, if I was only able to make one episode, it would have been Star Wars. So that's the first thing. The second thing is Star Wars. Here's the thing. A lot of the toys we covered, like Barbie or G.I. Joe, technically they are 40, 50, 60 years old. I made a choice to really focus uh, on the 80s and 90s because and late 70s, because I was like, listen, if we cover seven or eight decades, that's going to be a very shallow show. So once I made the decision to focus only on basically two to two and a half decades, the toy that literally changed the direction of toys was Star Wars in many ways, the three and three quarter inches the accessories, the vehicles, everything like that. So, I mean, there's no He-Man without Star Wars toys. The G.I. Joe, the Snake Eyes, Storm Shadow, Cobra Commander, there's no that version of G.I. Joe without Star Wars. Star Wars affected Barbie. So that was why we started with Star Wars. And to be honest with you, the minute the show was greenlit, I was like, you know what? I'm going to replicate ILM. So what better way to say to the audience very quickly from literally the first second of the show, holy, I don't know if I can curse or not, um, but uh, if I can't curse, I always feel like my father when I say, holy cow. Uh, so I was like, what a great way to say to the audience, holy shit, they recreated ILM. The minute we did that, people were like, oh, this show is going to be different. Whoever made this show gets it. They're treating ILM in 1975 like 
a History Channel doc would treat Gettysburg. And what better way to do that than with the Star Wars episode? Yeah, that was a smart move. And coming out in Christmas time was an amazing move because everybody was together and this new show hits Netflix and they're like, what? What is this crazy show? <laughs> Here's the thing, Brian. I call myself an avid toy collector. Some of my team call me an expert and I probably have over 40,000 pieces of toys. And you did the best Jeez. thing from the 70s through the 90s that's where my collection lies i have like four vaults full i call them vaults they're actually like storages you know but i call them my vaults <laughs> but uh <laughs> hey you picked the right era and every one of these toys you put on it i have most of them and i love it because when i went to my collection i was like there's a show because of you now you're worth more and you made my prices go up man you did and I love it. It's so, <laughs> dude, it's so, it's so funny you say that, man. I was in Salt Lake City last weekend. Uh, I travel a lot for the, the comedy stuff that we do. And uh, I always pop into stores. I always try to go to new stores. Um, and I was in Salt Lake City. I went to the store I'd never been to before. And he had a terror drone, you know, from Turtles. I think he was selling it for like about a buck forty or a buck fifty. And I, I said to the owner, I'm like, Hey man, listen to me. Don't listen to me. You do whatever you want, but season three is coming out soon. You might want to take that off the shelf for four or five months. Uh, cause I mean, dude, I bought, I was never into He-Man ever, um, at all. Zero percent. So when the show was greenlit, I had zero He-Man while making the episode. I fell in love with He-Man. I bought a battle cat before the show came out for 30 bucks, mint condition, saddle, helmet, everything. And I mean, those are going for, I mean, between 80 and 120, $130 now. And, uh, it's crazy. So I have definitely heard this before. <laughs> oh yeah. Even more. I don't want to geek and nerd out into that stuff, but, uh, I love your season one star Wars, then Barbie, then he man, and then G.I. Joe. And then season two, you started with Star Trek. Now, a lot of people are Trekkies and some love Star Wars. There probably was a big amount of people that probably emailed you. You should have came out with Star Trek first, but you did the right thing. And then in season two, you came out with Star Trek, which is an amazing series beginner as well. You came out with another historical show. I know their toys aren't as popular, but it's cool. And then you went with Transformers and Legos, and then you killed it. And that was amazing. I can't wait for season three, man. You got some cool stuff coming out. You have Power Rangers. You have stuff about wrestling, My Little Pony, and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You know, you have every toy that everybody can want for from those eras. I mean, that's that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, it, it's funny. I thought you were going to go in a different direction with that because I get a lot of grief for doing Star Trek. Uh, people, uh, no, you know, now that, that everybody... <laughs> so, no, I'm, I'm glad you are. Like I said, I thought, I thought the, you, your sentence ended differently than I thought it was going to start. <laughs> uh, because a lot of people were like, and maybe it's changed because everybody knows Turtles and, and, and Power Rangers are coming. But at the time... So many people were like, why would you do Star Trek? Why wouldn't you do Turtles? Why wouldn't you do Power Rangers? Why wouldn't you do Hot Wheels? And to be honest with you, I did not know if we would ever be making any more episodes. And I'm a huge Trekkie. And I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. Um, uh, you know, Netflix is letting me choose the toys. It's a great story. It's kind of the anti-Star Wars story. Um, so there was like a compare and contrast variable that I always find very interesting. I love that episode. Um, but yeah, I, I got a lot of grief for that. Um, but no, I, it's so funny. I haven't thought about this, but I am definitely getting less grief now. Uh, and that I'm sure is because people know we finally got around to two of the other biggies. Well, the thing is, there's so many toys out there. What can you cover? And Star Wars is an amazing toy. It's a huge franchise. Now that Disney took it over, it's become even bigger and more larger than life. And it's so amazing that your show is connected with that. And now everybody that watches these movies, go to your TV series as well and then watch the history that's such a huge connection, I think, and it was just a smart idea. Did you think of that, or it just happened luckily? Again, to be completely honest with you, man, I mean, that really was the plan all along, and season one premiered almost two years ago, and I still cannot believe this has happened. I still can't believe the response. 
We were at Comic-Con about a month ago. I mean, we were in a room last year of 250 people. They turned away uh, over a thousand. So this year, they put us in a room with 2,500 people, and they told us they turned away over 3,000. So I'm sitting there, you know, I'm on the panel looking at the audience, and I'm like, I mean, I just, I just could not believe it. And it's funny, so I've been saying for almost two years, like, this is surreal, this is surreal, this is surreal. I'm literally sitting there at Comic-Con at looking at all these thousands of people, and I upgraded it to, I feel like I'm living in a movie. Like, I just, I can, I, dude, I never thought I'd be on a fucking panel at Comic-Con, like, in, in a thousand years. I mean, I, I never did an interview in my life, like what you and I are doing right now. I never did anything like this in my life until season one came out. Like, this was all completely unexpected. I was a behind-the-scenes producer of comedy stuff. It literally feels like I'm living in a movie. Well, you entered a universe that supports you big time, and the fans just going to keep loving you more and more because you're just pulling on their strings. And especially with season three, these brands that you chose are humongously nostalgic and current at the same time. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Power Rangers, wrestling is like, you know, it's never going to go away. And then you got the My, My Little, Little Pony, Pony fans, you know? Yeah. <laughs> You do get a lot of uh, My Little Pony fans contacting you, asking you stuff? Well, not anymore. We used to, but then once they heard we were making the episode, they calmed down and were like, okay, cool, we'll wait to see it. And My Little Pony was the same thing for me as He-Man. Like, if anything, I'd like My Little Pony more than He-Man. That's how little interest <laughs> I had in He-Man. I had no My Little Pony whatsoever, um, and now, you know... I would say My Little Pony collection is almost equal in volume to He-Man. I know you know this. You said you got 45,000 toys. Oh, yeah. uh, it's more. all about the character. I lost count. <laughs> I thought I was bad. You're making me feel good, actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, really good. Really. I mean, I literally, since the show came out, I, I feel like I've lost my mind. Um, but no matter what the toy is, no matter what any of it is, it's just about the characters. And My Little Pony has great characters. He-Man has great characters. Um, so who wouldn't fall in love with anything once they know the characters. You did a great job with everything. And then in episode four in season two, you came out with Hello Kitty. And I was surprised by that. You know, I was surprised that you had Hello Kitty in there. But Hello Kitty is such a huge brand. And not a lot of people know that it's a brand from the 70s. They think it came out in the 90s because it was a big, huge craze here. The way you created the Hello Kitty episode was like a full documentary. A lot of these episodes are like its own full documentaries. They're really done right. They're really done nicely. You're interviewing the right people, bringing the right things on the show. Have you learned a lot since your season one? And did you change some things around for season two and now season two? Three. You know, one thing I just want to tell you that a lot of people don't know or understand, the biggest franchise is Pokemon. The second biggest franchise is Hello Kitty. Yes. So a lot of people are like, why did you do Hello Kitty? And I did it for two reasons. One is, again, I didn't know if I'd ever be able to get any more. The other seven episodes of season one and two, my wife couldn't and cared less about, but she's a huge Hello Kitty fan. A, I wanted to make something she would dig. B, I always like doing stuff that I don't know anything about, um, which also did include He-Man, I have to say. But Hello Kitty was just such a deep dive into a such an unfamiliar, bizarre world that I loved making it. And my hope was that for people that weren't into Hello Kitty, it's like if you trusted us with He-Man or you trusted us with G.I. Joe, um, hopefully you'll trust us to give the Hello Kitty episode uh, a chance, which is Hello Kitty was very challenging to make because unlike all the other toys, it, it, and again, I'm telling you this, man, it's the weirdest thing in the world to me. Like within an hour of starting to research and get into Hello Kitty, I learned to me, one of the strangest things I learned about anything making the entire series so far, none of these characters operate in the same world. And, um, I, and I remember we were at San Rio headquarters in LA and we were at a meeting and someone said that and I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like, Oh yeah, they're, they're, they're in their own little world. And I'm like, wait, so Hello Kitty can't talk to Gudetama? They're like, nope. And I'm like, well, that would be like if Han Solo can't talk to Luke. And they're like, yep. So it was a very hard episode to make because they're, they're, 
they're characters, but they're not really characters. So uh, the feedback we get on that episode is very, um, it's always very interesting to me. Uh, you know, somebody, what, what we saw a lot with Barbie in season one was always interesting to me as well, because a lot of people, when the show first came out on Facebook and everything, people were like, I loved all three episodes. I'm not watching Barbie. So that went on for about four or five months. Then around month five, month six, we started seeing, I love the show so much. I watched the Barbie episode because I couldn't watch the three again and again and again. So I'm like, ah, I'll watch the one I didn't watch. And you know what? Barbie is not only one of the best episodes, but all the other episodes are better now that I watched Barbie. So my hope was something similar would happen with Hello Kitty. That did not happen, for the record, but um, I definitely do hear a lot, and this does make me happy because this is what happened to me as well. I do hear a lot. I, like, completely blanked out and never pay attention to um, Hello Kitty, and now I do. So, And by the way, the same way I've become obsessed with some He-Man stuff, I am obsessed with Gudetama, and I'm obsessed with, like, real vintage 70s Hello Kitty. Because the thing that's so interesting about Hello Kitty in the 70s was it really was just a brand. So it was just a label. If you look at what Star Wars and Kenner were doing in the 70s, it's directly connected to what Hasbro and Lucasfilm and Disney are doing today. If you look at Hello Kitty stuff in 1974... Uh, uh, almost nothing in common with what Sanrio is doing today. Like, it's super bizarre. Now, to answer your second question, um, there is a major change in season three, which I'm very curious to see what people say or think about it. We decided not to do the reenactments at the opening of the episodes. The reason being, A, uh, no one seemed to care about them other than the Star Wars episode. You know, we have to really try and stay under 50 minutes an episode, and the reenactments eat up between two and four and a half minutes. So the issue was no one seems to care about the reenactments, and I need that time to tell a better story. So I made the decision, and we'll find out soon if it was the right one or the wrong one, to not do the reenactments. And basically, even though the episodes are not getting longer, uh, to have more storytelling time by not doing the reenactments. So that's really the only major change from seasons one and two. I think it's a cool move, and I think you have to keep the show fresh and keep it moving forward. People already love the show. You already have fans. They're going to watch it. And this is something new for them to look out for. So all of our fans out there, listen up. He's coming with something cool this season. So you got to support the show because I think maybe 80% of my fans on this show, and there's a lot of them, they're all into toys and our universe and, uh, you know, fandoms and this and that. So um, that's a cool thing, man. I love that. I can't wait for season three to come out. Here's one thing, though, Brian. Your success with the toys that made us kind of put something else in your mind, right? You have a new show that you're coming up with called The Movies That Made Us. What made you want to do that? Obviously, Netflix believed in the show because they greenlit eight episodes instantly without a pilot. So they believed in the show. They put their money where the mouth was, millions and millions of dollars to make it. So no doubt about that. When the show came out, uh, they were definitely blown away with how well it did. So basically, whenever things go well in life, as you know, people are like, that went great. How do we do more of that? So I went in and I pitched several different ideas of spinoffs. And the, what, the way I pitched movies that made us, it's funny, I'm looking at it right now. I, you know that famous picture of the um, Die Hard poster with Bruce Willis and the tank top and Nakatomi Plaza's in the background? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I had full-size posters made of that picture, except instead of it being Bruce Willis, it was Frank Sinatra. So I walk in, I show them the poster, and they're like, what is that? And I'm like, that's the movies that made us because what you don't know is Die Hard is actually a sequel to a movie that had come out like 12 years earlier where Frank Sinatra played the lead and legally he had to play the sequel and they were talking to him about doing the sequel 
when he was like, guys, I'm 73. I, I can't run around with, without shoes on and glass. So that, so that image of, of Sinatra as McLean, that's what got it greenlit. That's pretty cool. I did not know that. You see, man? You just taught me something. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> that's crazy. Wow. Yeah, it, dude, it's, it's bananas. It, it's bananas. The, like, the, uh, the, whole, the whole book that Die Hard is based on, I mean, it is dark, dark dark shit like they all die at the end i mean it's it's at the end of the movie it's him and his daughter so it's not his wife in the movie and the whole thing with the divorce and all that stuff that's really not in the book uh actually that's not in the book at all um it's about his daughter and i know for a fact at the end of the book his daughter dies if i remember correctly and i haven't read, it's been a year since i read it but if i remember correctly i believe mclean accidentally kills his own daughter um, I mean, it, it is so dark. Wow, that's pretty cool. So can you share, is it going to be four episodes or is it going to be eight or ten? Is it going to follow the toys that made it, us kind of uh, it's four you know, episodes. blueprint? It's four episodes. Okay, so four, keeping it at four so people keep wanting. Why did you do four episodes so people could keep wanting more? Or it's just so much work behind each episode? Because each one's like a full documentary. So Netflix has staggering amounts of data. And they use this data to do things that to people that don't work there and don't have the data, some of it seems brilliant. Like, why wouldn't you drop all the episodes on the same day? As you know, Netflix invented that. But other stuff they do that makes sense to them might not make sense to other people because they don't have the data. But it's very smart. And what that company does and the people they hire, I mean, these are literally, you know, the smartest of the smart people that work there. Even though I would love to have made eight episodes, even though from what I hear from the public, they wish we made eight more episodes of Toys, and a lot of people are bummed out we only made four more. I am too, by the way. But Netflix knows, like, it's better to keep doing four at a time than to do eight or 10 and have people get burnt out. So that's the first thing. They have the data that supports this decision. And I've never seen Netflix do anything that wasn't right or smart. So, but from the inside. And then to your point, you're absolutely right about this. This shit takes forever, man. I mean, we, we, uh, we it, it takes a staggering amount of time to make these episodes because the pre-production period uh, is almost four months. I mean, we pre-interview everybody twice before the actual interview. We interview them verbally over the phone. Then we interview that same person by Skype and we record it. Then we get on an airplane and fly to interview them. And sometimes we go back. Uh, Marty Abrams, we interviewed him five separate times for seasons one and two. So, like, the, as you uncover more stuff, you got to get other people's point of view. So, they take a long time. So, that's the long-winded answer to your question. Well, that's a smart answer. We've supported your show. We've done posts. And people are like, what, do you know when this is going to happen? I'm like, hey, we're Comic-Con Radio. We're not the toys that made us. We're not Netflix. I like what you do, man. You're a very <laughs> cool so dude. kind of you. You're a very cool dude. That's you very know kind of you, man. You respond to people. You make these cool videos. And when my producer showed me that video you made, and you told people, hey, the next episode's coming out in, what, 2040-something, I was, I was just rolling on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Which producer does that? Who does this? And then I was like, Brian's a comedian. Why shouldn't he do something like that? Why shouldn't he create a video like that and give it to the public? And that's cool how you're connecting with everyone. Do you feel a lot of connection with the fans? Do you get a lot of like messages and DMs and all these kind of stuff? It's so funny, man. Like the example I'm going to give is what you already said because yes, I definitely feel connected. Do you want to know the reason why I made that video? Yes. I was in a toy store, a vintage toy store, uh, and uh, you know, I'm sitting there looking, you know, shopping, whatever, and two people separately came up to me in the store. Um, and by the way, I feel like I have the greatest, luckiest, like best of all worlds thing ever in that if I am not in a toy store, nobody knows who I am. Being famous, I think, would be the worst thing on earth. So it's so great not to be famous except in toy stores. In a toy store, 
Uh, I definitely get, uh, you know, people talking to me and stuff, which is, again, very surreal and bizarre. But anyway, so I'm in the store. Two people come up to me separately about 20 minutes apart and are like, hey, man, love the show. Love you. What the fuck is going on with season three? And I'm like, all right, I, I got to say something. I got to say something. So uh, like, that's why I made the video, because like, that had not happened before. And to have two separate people come up to me like that, I'm like, all right, I, I got to put something out. We're putting out another video today um, where, and it, it's again, it's, it's just so crazy, but we, uh, there's a lot of processes we have to follow. Um, so we are actually today, uh, this sounds so cheesy and crazy and weird and dumb and bananas, but we are today putting out a video saying uh, we are announcing the date of when we're announcing the date of season three. So that, that is coming out today. And, uh, it, it may have even already happened for all I know, but, uh, it is, I believe on September 3rd, uh, we're going to reveal, uh, or announce or say whatever word you prefer, uh, the, uh, release date of season three, but it's, uh, it's getting a little wacky. Well, Hey, it's fun, right? It, it goes with the show. And it's built like this thing now that people should expect this. And maybe this is becoming like a shtick to be part of what you're doing with the toys that made us and movies that made us. You create these videos in anticipation of a date of a date when you're releasing a date for a date. How about that? I, I, I definitely <laughs> did my best to turn that into a joke in the video. Uh, I, uh, I, hope, I, hope I, I hope I accomplished it. But, uh, no, that's going to be cool. It's, like I said, I, I feel like I'm living in a movie. It's all good, man. We're going to share it. And also one more thing. I know you have a busy day, but I just wanted to say big ups because your season one of Movies That Made Us, Dirty Dancing, Home Alone, Ghostbusters, and Die Hard. Fabulous movies. Those movies are ridiculously awesome. Did you pick your favorite movies, or were they things that you thought that everybody would love? Yeah, none of those are my favorite movies, but <laughs> we knew, uh, <laughs> just being honest, uh, we knew we were coming out uh, around Christmas, and uh, we definitely wanted to have a Christmas vibe uh, to the movies. So that's, that explains Die Hard, which I do love. Uh, that explains Home Alone, uh, which I like a lot. Um, Ghostbusters, I'm like, fuck it, we just gotta do Ghostbusters. And to be honest with you, uh, Dirty Dancing, if, uh, you know, all I can be is honest. I chose Dirty Dancing because I know that is one of the most successful, most profitable films of all time. And, uh, you know, I want to make more episodes. And uh, I, I chose a movie where I'm like, listen, you know, I want to have great ratings, so they let me make more. And if, with true irony, I, identical to the He-Man episode in season one of Toys, <laughs> like my favorite movie now of the four is Dirty Dancing. My favorite episode of the four is Dirty An uh, Dancing. Uh, the producer of the movie, uh, this lady named Linda Gottlieb, uh, like I've become obsessed with her. Um, the same way I became obsessed with like Battle Cat in the E-Man episode. Um, I know that's a weird thing to say. One's a plastic green lion. But anyway, it's an amazing, amazing story. Um, and like I said, uh, it, of the first four episodes, is my favorite. Crazy thing is both of them have shirtless, muscle-bound people dancing around. <laughs> so you must I did not that. make that connection. <laughs> I did, maybe, maybe you're out to something. Yeah, there you go. You, maybe you like dancing and maybe you like working out. I don't know. Must be those things. But that's cool, I man. I hate both those things. So maybe it's something see, else. Listen, man. Everything you hate, you should start making a show. Maybe you should start doing that. Maybe that's the thing. That's the golden ticket. Because what you hate, make it so good. <laughs> maybe that's what's hitting You know, the home runs. You never know. You might be on to something. There you you might be on to something. Look into that, man. Look into that. So anything you want to tell the fans, any new projects, anything other than these things that you're working on? Interesting. So I'll talk about what we're working on, and then I'll talk about toys. So hopefully I'm answering this question right, and if I'm not, just tell me. So we're doing this great show called Discontinued that premiered on CW. We're making more of those right now. You can see the pilot on Amazon Prime. A show that's very near and dear to my heart. It's all about discontinued products and experiences. So it's like about um, the original Humvee. It's about Toys R Us. It's about Blockbuster. So it, it just it explains similar to toys with using humor, uh, but also knowledge and information and history 
you know, it's all about just things that aren't around anymore. And, you, you know, we try to do it in a fun way, uh, but explain why. So we're very proud of that. As usual, I got a whole bunch of stuff I can't even talk about. Uh, we're producing the next generation of Mad About You, so that we actually have our table read for that, our first table read tomorrow. Um, we're doing that for Sony and, and Charter, and everybody's back, uh, Paul Reiser, Helen Hunt, you name it. So I can talk about that. We're doing something very cool for Disney, but I can't say with that. Disney Plus, that's their new thing. Uh, we have a great show coming out with Zac Efron. I can't talk about that yet. It's funny, I always feel like I work at the CIA because there's so much stuff I can't talk about. But yeah, we're, uh, we've got some stuff going on. And then as it relates to toys and movies that made us, you know, the two things I just want to always say is I, I can't have 10, 20, 30 people doing interviews and press for the show. There really needs to be one person, so I get to do all that. But I just always like to be clear, to say that this show is made by a team, that's not me trying to be like, I couldn't have done it without the team. But I, it, I really couldn't have done it without the team. I mean, it is a... A passionate group. I mean, I, I believe it or not, I am probably the person on the show that knows the least about toys. Uh, you, you made a really interesting point earlier on. Uh, I am a collector of toys. I am not a historian of toys. So the passion and dedication that a couple dozen people put into the show, the editors, the showrunner, is staggering. So whenever I get asked, is there anything else you want to say, I always like to make that point. And then the other point I like to make is, Obviously, every time you watch an episode, Netflix is aware of it. So please keep watching the show. Watch it more than once. If you watch seven episodes and you didn't watch He-Man, watch He-Man. Because we want to make more. And the way for us to make more is for Netflix to see that they're getting the value for all the money they're spending to make the show. So that's the two things I'd like to tell you. We have a hashtag that we created years ago. It's called Watch Live. We created this to support a lot of TV shows. And we always tell everyone out there, please watch the shows on its natural way that it comes out. Yours comes out on Netflix. Go to Netflix app. Watch the show. Don't go on your little specialty apps. I know it's easier, and I know sometimes it's probably free, and I get it. I understand. But if you keep wanting to support, and, you, and if you actually, if you want these shows to keep going on, you have to go on Netflix and watch it there. So I always urge the fans to do that exactly. because then they Thank complain. You. They're complaining all the time on social media. Why did this show get canceled? Why did that happen? Because you didn't watch it live. And it's wonderful that you come on and you speak because... You know what's up. You created the show. I speak to actors all the time, and I speak to directors. But when I speak to showrunners and producers or creators, they come out with all the juicy stuff. So who else would have said all these things but you or who is allowed to say more than you? You know what's up. You know what the threshold is. And it's amazing. And, Brian, I would love to bring you back on season by season. Whenever you want to come on, promote anything, come on, let's chat. Uh, we'll talk about toys. You're a cool dude. And with that said, is there anything you want to tell the fans before we head out? I wish there was a more powerful way of saying thank you, but I'm not aware of it. So all I can say is thank you. Um, I lived a very blessed life before Toys of Betas came out, and somehow because of the reaction from the fans, it became even more blessed. So uh, I wish I could invent a better way of saying thank you, but all I could say is thank you, and it literally sometimes makes me tear up and cry, uh, the appreciation uh, we get from the fans. So thank you. That's really cool, dude. And if you want to get a hold of you on social media, on Instagram and Twitter, it's uh, Brian Volk Weiss, correct? Yeah, I'm not on Twitter. Who knows why? Uh, but I'm definitely on uh, Instagram uh, and Facebook uh, under my own name. So uh, Brian Volk Weiss. Uh, and uh, I, uh, you know, I try. I view Instagram in particular as like a living digital diary. So um, if, you, if, if you're into any of the stuff we're doing, uh, it's a good way to see, you know, somewhat daily what we're up to you might get sick of seeing pictures of my wife and kids but you know every now and then i'll show some toys there you go well ladies and gems you heard it here if you want to follow brian watch what he's doing on a daily basis and some of these cool things that he can <laughs> release <laughs> it's on instagram and facebook it's brian volk weiss descriptions will be in this episode 
Say what's up to him. Follow him. Go to the toys that made us on Netflix. Watch his new show, Movies That Made Us. Season 3 commercial is coming out. Do not message us. Go to his page. Go to Toys That Made Us. Watch the video. That's going to tell you the date of the date that the show is airing for season three, which is a cool idea. Brian, my man, with that said, it was lovely having you on the show. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is your boy, Galaxy, with the cool Brian Vogue Weiss from the Toys That Made Us and the new movies that made us. And we're signing out from another amazing episode of Comic-Con Radio. Brian, we got to blow kisses to everybody. I know it's embarrassing, but three, two, one, mwah, kisses to the universe. Mwah. There you go, man. First time I ever did Thanks that. for doing that, bro. I really appreciate it. And we got to say bro, thank you. Peace. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is Galaxy signing out from another amazing episode of Comic-Con Radio. Tune in for your daily shows of Comic-Con Radio. Go to comic-con-radio.com. Reach us on social media, Instagram, at Comic-Con Radio. Comic-Con Radio, taking the world one listener at a time. Awesome. And thank you, thank you, thank you for everything. Thank you for the support.